Section 1 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mammal, Tyler, Texas. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Mermaid Far out to sea, the water is as blue as the bluest cornflower, and as clear as the clearest crystal, but it is very deep, too deep for any cable to fathom, and if many steeples were piled on top of one another, they would not reach from the bed of the sea to the surface of the water. It is down there that the mermen live. Now don't imagine that there are only bare white sands at the bottom. Oh no, the most wonderful trees and plants grow there with such flexible stalks and leaves that at the slightest motion of the water they move just as if they were alive. All the fish, big and little, glide among the branches just as, up here, birds glide through the air. The palace of the Merman King lies at the very deepest part. Its walls are of coral, and the long pointed windows of the clearest amber, but the roof is made of mussel shells, which open and shut with the lapping of the water. This has a lovely effect, for there are gleaming pearls in every shell, any one of which would be the pride of a queen's crown. The Merman King had been for many years a widower, but his old mother kept house for him. She was a clever woman but so proud of her noble birth that she wore twelve oysters on her tail while the other grandees were only allowed six. Otherwise, she was worthy of all praise, especially because she was so fond of the little mermaid princesses, her grandchildren. They were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of all. Her skin was as soft and delicate as a rose leaf. Her eyes as blue as the deepest sea, but like all the others, she had no feet, and instead of legs, she had a fish's tail. All the live long day, they used to play in the palace, in the great halls where living flowers grew out of the walls. When the great amber windows were thrown open, the fish swam in, just as swallows fly into our room when we open the windows. But the fish swam right up to the little princesses ate out of their hands and allowed themselves to be patted. Outside the palace was a large garden with fiery red and deep blue trees, the fruit of which shone like gold, while the flowers glowed like fire on their ceaselessly waving stalks. The ground was of the finest sand, but it was a blue phosphorescent tint. Everything was bathed in a wondrous light down there. You might more readily have supposed yourself to be high up in the air with only the sky above and below you than that you were at the bottom of the ocean. In a dead calm, you could just catch a glimpse of the sun like a purple flower with a stream of light radiating from its calyx. Each little princess had her own little plot of garden where she could dig and plant just as she liked. One made her flower bed in the shape of a whale Another thought it nice to have hers like a little mermaid, but the youngest made hers quite round like the sun, and she would only have flowers of a rosy hue in its beams. She was a curious child, quiet and thoughtful, while the other sisters decked out their gardens with all kinds of extraordinary objects which they got from wrecks. She would have had nothing beside the rosy flowers like the sun up above except the statue of a beautiful boy. It was hewn out of the purest white marble and had gone to the bottom from some wreck. By the statue she planted a rosy, red, weeping willow, which grew splendidly, and the fresh, delicate branches hung round and over it till they almost touched the blue sand where the shadows showed violet, and were ever moving like the branches. It looked as if the leaves and the roots were playfully interchanging kisses. Nothing gave her greater pleasure than to hear about the world of human beings up above. She made her old grandmother tell her all that she knew about ships and towns, people and animals, 
but above all it seemed strangely beautiful to her that up on the earth the flowers were scented for they were not so at the bottom of the sea also that the woods were green and that the fish which were to be seen among the branches could sing so loudly and sweetly that it was a delight to listen to them you see the grandmother called little birds fish or the mermaids would not have understood her as they had never seen a bird when you are fifteen said the grandmother you will be allowed to rise up from the sea and sit on the rocks in the moonlight and look at the big ships sailing by and you will also see woods and towns one of the sisters would be fifteen in the following year but the others well they were each one year younger than the other so that the youngest had five whole years to wait before she would be allowed to come up from the bottom to see what the things were like on earth but each one promised the others to give a full account of all they had seen and found most wonderful on the first day their grandmother could never tell them enough for there were so many things about which they wanted information none of them was so full of longings as the youngest the very one who had the longest time to wait and who was so quiet and dreamy many a night she stood by the open windows and looked up through the dark blue water which the fish were lashing with their tails and fins she could see the moon and the stars it is true their light was pale but they looked much bigger through the water than they do to our eyes when she saw a dark shadow glide between her and them she knew that it was either a whale swimming above her or else a ship laden with human beings i am certain they never dreamt that a lovely little mermaid was standing below stretching up her white hands toward the keel the eldest princess had now reached her fifteenth birthday and was to venture above the water when she came back she had hundreds of things to tell them but the most delightful of all she said was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank in the calm sea and to gaze at the large town close to the shore where the lights twinkled like hundreds of stars to listen to music and the noise and bustle of carriages and people to see the many church towers and spires and to hear the bells ringing and just because she could not go on shore she longed for that most of all oh how eagerly the youngest sister listened and when later in the evening she stood at the open window and looked up through the dark blue water she thought of the big town with all its noise and bustle and fancied she could even hear the church bells ringing the year after the second sister was allowed to mount up through the water and swim about wherever she liked the sun was just going down when she reached the surface the most beautiful sight she thought that she had ever seen the whole sky had looked like gold she said and as for the clouds well their beauty was beyond description they floated in red and violet splendor over her head and far faster than they went a flock of wild swans flew like a long white veil over the water towards the setting sun she swam towards it but it sank and all the rosy lights on clouds and water faded away the year after that the third sister went up and being much the most venturesome of them all swam up a broad river which ran into the sea she saw beautiful green vine-clad hills palaces and country seats peeping through splendid woods she heard the birds singing and the sun was so hot that she was often obliged to dive to cool her burning face in a tiny bay she found a troop of little children running about naked and paddling in the water she wanted to play with them but they were frightened and ran away then a little black animal came up it was a dog but she had never seen one before it barked so furiously at her that she was frightened and made for the green sea she could never forget the beautiful woods the green hills and the lovely children who could swim through the water although they had no fishes tails the fourth sister was not so brave 
she stayed in the remotest part of the ocean, and according to her account, that was the most beautiful spot. You could see for miles and miles around you, and the sky above was like a great glass dome. She had seen ships, but only far away, so that they looked like seagulls. There were grotesque dolphins turning somersaults and gigantic whales squirting water through their nostrils like hundreds of fountains on every side. Now the fifth sister's turn came. Her birthday fell in winter so that she saw sights that the others had not seen on their first trips. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each one of which looked like a pearl, she said, but was much bigger than the church towers built by men. They took the most wonderful shapes and sparkled like diamonds. She had seated herself on one of the largest, and all the passing ships sheared off in alarm when they saw her sitting there with her long hair streaming loose in the wind. In the evening, the sky became overcast with dark clouds. It thundered and lightened, and the huge icebergs glittering in the bright lightning were lifted high into the air by the black waves. All the ships shortened sail, and there was fear and trembling on every side. But she sat quietly on her floating iceberg, watching the blue lightning flash in zigzags down onto the shining sea. The first time any of the sisters rose above water, she was delighted by the novelties and beauties she saw, but once grown up and at liberty to go where she liked, she became indifferent and longed for her home. In the course of a month or so, they all said that, after all, their own home in the deep was best. It was so cozy there. Many an evening, the five sisters, interlacing their arms, would rise above the water together. They had lovely voices, much clearer than any mortal, and when a storm was rising, and they expected the ships to be wrecked, they would sing in the most seductive strains of the wonders of the deep, bidding the seafarers have no fear of them. But the sailors could not understand the words. They thought it was the voice of the storm. Nor could it be theirs to see this Elysium of the deep, for when the ship sank, they were drowned, and only reached the merman's palace in death. When the elder sisters rose up in this manner, arm in arm, in the evening, the youngest remained quite alone behind, looking after them as if she must weep. But mermaids have no tears, and so they must suffer all the more. Oh! If I were only fifteen, she said, I know how fond I would be of the world above and of the mortals who dwell there. At last her fifteenth birthday came. Now we shall have you off our hands, said her grandmother, the old queen dowager. Come now, let me adorn you like your other sisters. And she put a wreath of white lilies round her hair but every petal of the flowers was half a pearl. Then the old queen had eight oysters fixed on the princess's tail to show her high rank. But it hurts so, said the little mermaid. You must endure the pain for the sake of finery, said her grandmother, but oh, how gladly she would, would she have shaken off all this splendor and laid aside the heavy wreath. Her red flowers in her garden suited her much better, but she did not dare to make any alteration. Goodbye, she said, and mounted as lightly and airily as a bubble through the water. The sun had just set when her head rose above the water, but the clouds were still lighted up with a rosy and golden splendor, and the evening star sparkled in the soft pink sky. The air was mild and fresh, and the sea as calm as a mill pond. A big three-masted ship lay close by, with only a single sail set, for there was not a breath of wind, and the sailors were sitting about the rigging on the cross trees and at the mastheads. There was music and singing on board, and as the evening closed in, hundreds of gaily colored lanterns were lighted. They looked like flags of all nations waving in the air. The little mermaid swam right up to the cabin windows, and every time she was lifted by the swell, she could see, through the transparent panes, crowds of gaily dressed people. The handsomest of them all was the young prince with large dark eyes. 
he could not be much more than 16, and all these festivities were in honor of his birthday. The sailors danced on deck, and when the prince appeared among them, hundreds of rockets were let off, making it as light as day, and frightening the little mermaid so much that she had to dive under the water. She soon ventured up again, and it was just as if all the stars of heaven were falling in showers around her. She had never seen such magic fires. Great suns whirled around, gorgeous firefish hung in the blue air, and all was reflected in the calm and glassy sea. It was so light on board the ship that every little rope could be seen, and the people still better. Oh, how handsome the prince was! How he laughed and smiled as he greeted his guests while the music rang out in the quiet night. It got quite late, but the little mermaid could not take her eyes off the ship and the beautiful prince. The colored lanterns were put out, no more rockets were sent up, and the cannon had ceased its thunder, but deep down in the sea there was a dull murmuring and moaning sound. Meanwhile she was rocked up and down on the waves so that she could look into the cabin, but the ship got more and more way on, sail after sail was filled by the wind. The waves grew stronger, great clouds gathered, and it lightened in the distance. Oh, there was going to be a fearful storm, and soon the sailors had to shorten sail. The great ship rocked and rolled as she dashed over the angry seas. The black waves rose like mountains, high enough to overwhelm her, but she dived like a swan through them and rose again and again on their towering crests. The little mermaid thought it a most amusing race, but not so the sailors. The ship creaked and groaned. The mighty timbers bulged and bent under the heavy blows, and water broke over the deck, snapping the main mast like a reed. She heeled over on her side, and the water rushed into the hold. Now the little mermaid saw that they were in danger, and she had, for her own sake, to beware of the floating beams and wreckage. One moment it was so pitch dark that she could not see at all, but when the lightning flashed, it became so light that she could see all on board. Every man was looking out for his own safety as best he could. But she more particularly followed the young prince with her eyes, and when the ship went down, she saw him sink in the deep sea. At first, she was quite delighted, for now she, he was coming to be with her. But then she remembered that human beings could not live under water, and that only if he were dead could he go to her father's palace. No, he must not die. So she swam towards him, all among the drifting beams and planks, quite forgetting that they might crush her. She dived deep under the water, and came up again through the waves, and at last reached the young prince, just as he was becoming unable to swim any further in the stormy sea. His limbs were numb, his bright eyes were closing and he must have died if the little mermaid had not come to the rescue. She held his head above the water and let the waves drive them whithersoever they would. By daybreak, all the storm was over. Of the ship not a trace was to be seen. The sun rose from the water in radiant brilliance, and his rosy beam seemed to cast a glow of life into the prince's cheeks. But his eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his hair and lofty brow, and stroked back the dripping hair. It seemed to her that he was like the marble statue in her little garden. She kissed him again, and longed that he might live. At last she saw dry land before her, high blue mountains, on whose summits the white snow glistened as if a flock of swans had settled there. Down by the shore were beautiful green woods, and in the foreground a church or a temple, she did not quite know which. But it was a building of some sort. Lemon and orange trees grew in the garden, and lofty palms stood by the gate. At this point the sea formed a little bay where water was quite, quite calm, but very deep, right up to the cliffs. At their foot was a strip of fine white sand to which she, she swam with the beautiful prince, and laid him down on it, taking great care that his head should rest high up in the warm sunshine. The bells now began to ring in the great white building, and a number of young maidens came into the garden. 
then the little mermaid swam further off behind some high rocks and covered her hair and breast with foam so that no one should see her little face and then she watched to see who would discover the poor prince it was not long before one of the maidens came up to him at first she seemed quite frightened but only for a moment then she fetched several others and the mermaid saw that the prince was coming to life and that he smiled at all those around him but he never smiled at her you see he did not know that she had saved him she felt so sad that when he was led away into the great building she dived sorrowfully into the water and made her way home to her father's palace always quiet and thoughtful she became more so now than ever her sisters often asked her what she had seen on her first visit to the surface but she never would tell them anything many an evening and many a morning she would rise to the place where she had left the prince she saw the fruit in the garden ripen and then gathered she saw the snow melt on the mountain's tops but she never saw the prince so she always went home still sadder than before at home her only consolation was to sit in her little garden with her arms twined round the handsome marble statue which reminded her of the prince it was all in gloomy shade now as she had ceased to tend her flowers and the garden had become a neglected wilderness of long stalks and leaves entangled with the branches of the tree at last she could not bear it any longer she so she told one of her sisters and from her it soon spread to the others but to no one else except to one or two other mermaids who only told their dearest friends one of these knew all about the prince she had also seen the festivities on the ship she knew where he had come from and where his kingdom was situated come little sister said the other princesses and throwing their arms round each other's shoulders they rose from the water in a long line just in front of the prince's palace it was built of light yellow glistening stone with great marble staircases one of which led into the garden magnificent gilded cupolas rose above the roof and the spaces between the columns which encircle the buildings were filled with lifelike marble statues through the clear glass of the lofty windows you could see gorgeous halls adorned with costly silken hangings and the pictures on the walls were a sight worth seeing in the midst of the central hall a large fountain played throwing its jets of spray upwards to a glass dome in the roof through which the sunbeams lighted up the water and the beautiful plants which grew in the great basin she knew now where he lived and often used to go there in the evenings and by night over the water she swam much nearer the land than any of the others dared she even ventured right up the narrow channel under the splendid marble terrace which threw a long shadow over the water she used to sit here looking at the young prince who thought he was quite alone in the clear moonlight she saw him many an evening sailing about in his beautiful boat with flags waving and music playing she used to peep through the green rushes and if the wind happened to catch her long silvery veil and any one saw it they only thought it was a swan flapping its wings many a night she heard the fishermen who were fishing by torchlight talking over the good deeds of the young prince she was happy to think that she had saved his life when he was drifting about on the waves half dead and she could not forget how closely his head had pressed her breast and how passionately she had kissed him but he knew nothing of all this and never saw her even in his dreams she became fonder and fonder of mankind and longed more and more to be able to live among them their world seemed so infinitely bigger than hers with their ships they could scour the ocean they could ascend them hot mountains high above the clouds and their wooded grass-grown lands extended further than her eye could reach there was so much that she wanted to know but her sisters could not give an answer to all her questions so she asked her old grandmother who knew the upper world well and rightly called it the country above the sea 
If men are not drowned, asked the little mermaid, do they live forever? Do they not die as we do down here in the sea? Yes, said the old lady. They have to die too, and their lifetime is even shorter than ours. We may live here for three hundred years, but when we cease to exist, we become mere foam on the water, and do not have so much as a grave among our dear ones. We have no immortal souls. We have no future life. We are just like this green seaweed, which, once cut down, can never revive again. Men, on the other hand, have a soul which lives for ever, lives after the body has become dust. It rises through the clear air up to the shining stars. Just as we rise from the water to see the land of mortals, so they rise up to unknown, beautiful regions which we shall never see. Why have we no immortal souls? asked the little princess sadly. I would give all my three hundred years to be a human being for one day and afterwards to have a share in the heavenly kingdom. You must not be thinking about that, said the grandmother. We are much better off and happier than human beings. Then I shall have to die and float as foam on the water and never hear the music of the waves or see the beautiful flowers or the red sun. Is there nothing I can do to gain an immortal soul? No, said the grandmother. Only if a human being so loved you that you were more to him than mother or father. If all his thoughts and all his love were so centered in you that he would let the priest join your hands and would vow to be faithful to you here and to all eternity, then your body would be infused with his soul. Thus and only thus could you gain a share in the felicity of mankind. He would give you a soul while yet keeping his own, but that can never happen. That which is your greatest beauty in the sea, your fish's tail, is thought hideous upon earth. So little do they understand about it. To be pretty there, you must have two clumsy supports which they call legs. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sadly at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the grandmother. We will hop and skip during our three hundred years of life. It is surely a long enough time. And after it's over we shall rest all the better in our graves. There is to be a court ball tonight. This was a much more splendid affair than we ever see on earth. The walls and ceiling of the great ballroom were of thick but transparent glass. Several hundreds of colossal mussel shells, rose red and grass green, were ranged in order round the sides holding blue lights which illuminated the whole room and shone through the walls so that the sea outside was quite lit up. You could see countless fish, great and small, swimming toward the glass walls some with shining scales of crimson hue, while others were golden and silvery. In the middle of the room was a broad stream of running water, and on this the mermaids and mermen danced to their own beautiful singing. No earthly beings have such voices. The little mermaid sang more sweetly than any of them, and they all applauded her. For a moment she felt glad at heart for she knew that she had the finest voice either in the sea or on land. But soon she began to think again of, about the upper world. She could not forget the handsome prince and her sorrow in not possessing like him an immortal soul. 
Therefore she stole out of her father's palace, and while all within was joy and merriment, she sat sadly in her little garden. Suddenly she heard the sound of a horn through the water, and thought, Now he is out sailing up there. He whom I love more than father or mother, he to whom my thoughts cling, and to whose hands I am ready to commit happiness of my life, I will dare anything to win him and gain an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been very much afraid. She will perhaps be able to advise and help me. Thereupon the little, the little mermaid left the garden and went towards the roaring whirlpools at the back of which the witch lived. She had never been that way before. No flowers grew there, no seaweed. Only the bare gray sands stretched toward the whirlpools, which, like rushing mill wheels, swirled around, dragging everything that came within reach down to the depths. She had to pass between these boiling eddies to reach the witch's domain, and for a long way the only path led over warm, bubbling mud, which the witch called her peat bog. Her house stood behind this in the midst of a weird forest. All the trees and bushes were polyps, half animal and half plant. They looked like hundred-headed snakes growing out of the sand. The branches were long, slimy arms with tentacles like wriggling worms, every joint of which, from the root to the outermost tip, was in constant motion. They wound themselves tightly round whatever they could lay hold of and never let it escape. The little mermaid standing outside was quite frightened. Her heart beat fast with terror, and she nearly turned back, but then she remembered the prince and the immortal soul of mankind and took courage. She bound her long flowing hair tightly round her head so that the polyps should not seize her by it, folded her hands over her breast, and darted like a fish through the water in between the hideous polyps which stretched out their sensitive arms and tentacles towards her. She could see that every one of them had something or other which they had grasped with their hundred arms and which they held as if in iron bands the bleached bones of men who had perished at sea and sunk below peeped forth from the arms of some, while others clutched rudders and sea chests or the skeleton of some land animal. And most horrible of all, a little mermaid whom they had caught and suffocated. Then she came to a large opening in the wood where the ground was all slimy and where some huge fat water snakes were gambling about. In the middle of this opening was a house built of the bones of the wrecked. There sat the witch, letting a toad eat out of her mouth, just as mortals let a little canary eat sugar. She called the hideous water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl about on her unsightly bosom. Yeah, I know very well what you come here for, said the witch. It is very foolish of you. All the same, you shall have your way, because it will lead you into misfortune, my fine princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail, and instead you have two stumps to walk about on like human beings, so that the young prince may fall in love with you, and that you may win him and an immortal soul. Saying this, she gave such a loud, hideous laugh that the toad and snakes fell to the ground and wriggled about there. You are just in the nick of time, said the witch. Yeah, after sunrise tomorrow, I should not be able to help you until another year had run its course. I will make you a full potion, and before sunrise you must swim ashore with it, seat yourself on the beach and drink it. Then your tail will divide and shrivel up to what men call 
beautiful legs. But it hurts. It is as if a sharp sword were running through you. All who see you will say that you are the most beautiful child of man they have ever seen. You will keep your gliding gait. No dancer will rival you, but every step you take will be as if you were treading upon sharp knives, so sharp as to draw blood. If you are willing to suffer all of this, I am ready to help you. Yes, said the princess, with a trembling voice, think, thinking of the prince and of winning an undying soul. But remember, said the witch, when once you have received a human form, you can never be a mermaid again. You will never again be able to dive through the water to your, your sisters and to your father's palace. And if you do not succeed in winning the prince's love so that for your sake he will forget father and mother, cleave to you with his whole heart, let the priest join your hands and make you man and wife, you will gain no immortal soul. The first morning after his marriage with another, your heart will break and you will turn in the foam of the sea. I will do it, said the little mermaid, pale as death. But you will have to pay me, too. And it is no trifle that I demand. You have the most beautiful voice of any at the bottom of the sea, and I dare say that you think you will fascinate him with it, but you must give me that voice. I will have the best you possess in return for my precious potion. I have to mingle my own blood with it, so as to make it as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take my voice, said the little mermaid, what have I left? You beautiful form said the witch, your gliding gait and your speaking eyes. With these you ought surely to be able to bewitch a human heart. Well, have you lost courage? Put out your little tongue and I will cut it off for the powerful draft. Let it be done, said the little mermaid, and the witch put on her cauldron to brew the magic potion. There is nothing like cleanliness, said she, as she scoured the pot with a bundle of snakes. Then she punctured her breast and let the black blood drip into the cauldron, and the steam took the most weird shapes, enough to frighten anyone. Every moment the witch threw new ingredients into the pot, and when it boiled, the bubbling was like the sound of crocodiles weeping. At last the potion was ready, and it looked like the clearest water. There it is, said the witch, and thereupon she cut off the tongue of the little mermaid, who was dumb now and could neither sing nor speak. If the polyps should seize you when you go back through my wood, said the witch, just drop a single drop of this liquid on them and their arms and fingers, will burst into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no need to do this, for at the mere sight of the bright liquid which sparkled in her hand like a shining star, they drew back in terror. So soon she got past the wood, the bog, and the eddying whirlpools. She saw her father's palace. The lights were all out in the great ballroom, and no doubt all the household was asleep, but she did not dare to go in now that she was dumb and about to leave her home forever. She felt as if her heart would break with grief. She stole into the garden and plucked a flower from each of her sister's plots and wafted her hand countless kisses towards the palace and then rose up through the dark blue water. The sun had not risen when she came inside of the prince's palace 
and landed at the beautiful marble steps. The moon was shining bright and clear. The little mermaid drank the burning, stinging draft, and it was like a sharp, two-edged sword running through her tender frame. She fainted away and lay as if she were dead. When the sun rose on the sea, she woke up and became conscious of a sharp pang. But just in front of her stood the handsome young prince, fixing his cold black eyes on her. She cast hers down and saw that her fish's tail was gone, and that she had the prettiest little white legs any maiden could desire, but she was quite naked, so she wrapped her long, thick hair around her. The prince asked, who she was and how she came there. She looked at him tenderly and with a sad expression in her dark blue eyes, but could not speak. Then he took her by the hand and led her into the palace. Every step she took was, as the witch had forewarned her beforehand, as if she were treading on sharp knives and spikes, but she bore it gladly. Led by the prince, she moved as lightly as a bubble, and he and everyone else marveled at her gliding, graceful gait. Clothed in the, the costliest silks and muslins, she was the greatest beauty in the palace, but she was dumb and could neither sing nor speak. Beautiful slaves clad in silk and gold came forward and sang to the prince and his royal parents. One of them sang better than all the others. The prince clapped his hands and smiled at her. That made the little mermaid very sad, for she knew that she used to sing far better herself. She thought, Oh, if he only knew that for the sake of being with him, I had given up my voice forever. Now the slaves began to dance, graceful undulating dances to enchanting music. Thereupon the little mermaid, lifting her beautiful white arms and raising herself on tiptoe glided to the floor with a grace which none of the other dancers had yet attained with every motion her grace and beauty became more apparent and her eyes appealed more deeply to the heart than the songs of the slaves everyone was delighted with it especially the prince who called her his little foundling and she danced on and on, notwithstanding that every time her foot touched the ground, it was like treading on sharp knives. The prince said that she should always be near him, and he was al she was allowed to sleep outside his door on a velvet cushion. He had a man's dress made for her so that she could ride about with him. They used to ride through scented woods where the green branches brushed her shoulder and little birds sang among the fresh leaves. She climbed up the highest mountains with the prince, and although her, del her delicate feet bled so that others saw it, she only laughed and followed him until they saw the clouds sailing below them, like a flock of birds taking flight to the distant lands. At home in the prince's palace, when at night the others were asleep, she used to go out onto the marble steps. It cooled her burning feet to stand in the cold sea water and at such times she used to think of those she had left in the deep. One night her sisters came arm in arm. They sang so sorrowfully as they swam on the water that she beckoned to them, and they recognized her and told her how she had grieved them all. After that they visited her every night, and one night she saw a long way out her old grandmother, who for many years had not been above the water, and the mermaid king with his crown on his head, they stretched out their hands towards her, but did not venture so close to land as her sisters. Day by day, she became dearer to the prince. He loved her as one loves a good, sweet child, but it never entered his head to make her his queen. Yet unless she became his wife, she would never win an everlasting soul, but on his wedding morning would turn to sea foam. Am I not dearer to you than any of them, the little mermaid's eyes seemed to say when he took her in his arms and kissed her beautiful brow. Yes, you are the dearest one to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart of them all, and you are the fondest of me. You are also like a young girl I once saw, but 
whom I never expect to see again. I was on board a ship which was wrecked. I was driven on shore by the waves close to a holy temple where several young girls were ministering at the service. The youngest of them found me on the beach and saved my life. I saw her but twice. She was the only person I could love in this world. But you were like her. You almost drive her image out of my heart. She belongs to the holy temple and therefore by good fortune you have been sent to me and we will never part. Alas, he does not know that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I bore him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat behind the foam and watched to see if anyone would come. I saw the pretty girl he loves better than me. And the mermaid heaved a bitter sigh, for she could not weep. The girl belongs to the holy temple, he has said. She will never return to the world. They will never meet again. I am here with him. I see him every day. Yes, I will tend him, love him, and give up my life to him. But now the rumor ran that the prince was to be married to the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king, and for that reason was fitted out a beautiful ship. It was given out that the prince was going on a voyage to see the adjoining countries, but it was without doubt to see the king's daughter. He was to have a great suite with him, but the little mermaid shook her head and laughed. She knew the prince's intentions much better than any of the others. I must take this voyage, he had said to her. I must go and see the beautiful princess. My parents demand that but they will never force me to bring her home as my bride. I can never love her. She will not be like the lovely girl in the temple whom you resemble. If ever I had to choose a bride, it would sooner be you, with your speaking eyes, my sweet dumb foundling. And he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long hair, and laid his head upon her heart which already dreamt of human joys and an immortal soul. You are not frightened of the sea, I suppose, my dumb child, he said as they stood on the proud ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighboring king. And he told her about storms and calms and curious fish in the deep and the marvels seen by divers. She smiled at his tales, for she knew all about the bottom of the sea much better than anyone else. At night, in the moonlight, when all were asleep except the steersman who stood at the helm, she sat at the side of the ship trying to pierce the clear water with her eyes and fancied she saw her father's palace. And above it, her old grandmother with her silver crown on her head, looking up through the cross currents toward the keel of the ship. Then her sisters rose above the water, they gazed sadly at her, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them, smiled, and was about to tell them that all was going well and happily with her when the cabin boy approached and the sisters dived down. But he supposed that the white objects he had seen were nothing but flakes of foam. The next morning the ship entered the harbor of the neighboring king's magnificent city. The church bells rang and trumpets were sounded from every lofty tower while the soldiers paraded with flags flying and glittering bayonets. There was a fete every day. There was a succession of balls, and receptions followed one after the other. But the princess was not yet present. She was being brought up a long way off, in a holy temple, they said, and was learning all the royal virtues. At last she came, the little mermaid, stood eager to see her beauty, and she was obliged to confess that a lovelier creature she had never beheld. Her complexion was exquisitely pure and delicate, and her trustful eyes of the deepest blue shone through their dark lashes. 
it is you said the prince you who saved me when i lay almost lifeless on the beach and he clasped his blushing bride to his heart oh i am too happy he exclaimed to the little mermaid a greater joy than i had dared to hope for has come to pass you will rejoice at my joy for you love me better than any one then the little mermaid kissed his hand and felt as if her heart were broken already his wedding morn would bring death to her and change her to foam. All the church bells pealed and heralds rode through the town proclaiming the nuptials. Upon every altar throughout the land fragrant oil was burnt in costly silver lamps. Amid the swinging of censers by the priests, the bride and bridegroom joined hands and received the bishop's blessing. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, stood holding the bride's trains, but her ears were deaf to the festal strains. Her eyes saw nothing of the sacred ceremony. She was thinking of her coming death and of all that she had lost in the world. The same evening the bride and bridegroom embarked amidst the roar of cannon and the waving of banners. A royal tent of purple and gold softly cushioned was raised amidships where the bridal pair were to repose during the calm, cool night. The sails swelled in the wind, and the ship skimmed lightly and almost without motion over the transparent sea. At dusk, lanterns of many colors were lighted, and the sailors danced merrily on deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of the first time she came up from the sea and saw the splendor and gaiety. She now threw herself among the dancers, whirling as a swallow skims through the air when pursued. Her onlookers cheered in amazement. Never had she danced so divinely. Her delicate feet pained her as if they were cut with knives, but she did not feel it, for the pain at her heart was much sharper. She knew that it was the last night that she would draw breath the same air as he, and would look upon the mighty deep and the blue starry heavens. An endless night without thought and without dreams awaited her, who neither had a soul nor could win one. The joy and revelry on board lasted until long past midnight. She went on laughing and dancing, with the thought of death all the time in her heart, the prince caressed his lovely bride, and she played with his raven locks, and with their arms entwined they retired to the gorgeous tent. All became hushed and still on board the ship. Only the steersman stood at the helm. The little mermaid laid her white arms on the gunwale and looked eastwards for the pink-tinted dawn. The first sunbeam she knew would be her death. Then she saw her sisters rise from the water they were as pale as she was. Their beautiful long hair no longer floated on the breeze, for it had been cut off. We have given it to the witch to obtain her help so that you may not die tonight. She has given us a knife. Here it is. Look how sharp it is. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the prince's heart, and when his warm blood sprinkles your feet, they will join together and grow into a tail, and you will once more be a mermaid. You will be able to come down into the water to us and live out your three hundred years before you are turned into dead salt sea foam. Make haste. You or he must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother is so full of grief that her white hair has fallen off as ours fell under the witch's scissors. Slay the prince and come back to us. Quick, quick. Do you not see the rosy streak in the sky? In a few moments the sun will rise, and then you must die. Saying this, they heaved a wondrous sigh and sank among the waves. The little mermaid drew aside the purple curtain from the tent and looked at the beautiful bride asleep with her head on the prince's breast. She bent over him and kissed his fair brow, looked at the sky where the dawn was spreading fast, looked at the sharp knife, and again fixed her eyes on the prince who in his dream 
called his bride by name. Yes, she alone was in his thoughts. For a moment, the knife quivered in her grasp, then she threw it out, far among the waves, now rosy in the morning light, and where it fell, the water bubbled up like drops of blood. Once more she looked at the prince, with her eyes already dimmed by death, then dashed overboard and fell, her body dissolving into foam. Now the sun rose from the sea, and its kindly beams warmed the deadly cold foam, so that the little mermaid did not feel the chill of death. She saw the bright sun, and above her floated hundreds of beauteous ethereal beings through which she could see the white ship and the rosy heavens. Their voices were melodious, but so spirit-like that no human ear could hear them any more than an earthly eye could see their forms. Light as bubbles they floated through the air without the aid of wings. The little mermaid perceived that she had a form like theirs. It gradually took shape out of the foam. To whom am I coming? said she, her, and her voice sounded like that of the other being, so unearthly in its beauty that no music of ours could reproduce it. To the daughters of the air answered the others. A mermaid has no undying soul and can never gain one without winning the love of a human being. Her eternal life must depend upon an unknown power. Nor have the daughters of the air an everlasting soul. But by their own good deeds they may create one for themselves. We fly to the tropics, where mankind is the victim of hot and pestilent winds. There we bring cooling breezes. We diffuse the scent of flowers all around, and bring refreshment and healing in our train. When for three hundred years we have labored to do all the good in our power, we gain an undying soul and take a part in the everlasting joys of mankind, you, poor little mermaid, have with your whole heart struggled for the same thing as we have struggled for. You have suffered and endured, raised yourself to the spirit world of the air, and now by your own good deeds you may, in the course of three hundred years, work out for yourself an undying soul. Then the little mermaid lifted her transparent arms towards God's son, and for the first time shed tears. On board ship all was again life and bustle. She saw the prince with his lovely bride searching for her. They looked sadly at the bubbling foam as if they knew that she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen, she kissed the bride upon her brow smiled at the prince and rose aloft with the other spirits of the air to the rosy clouds which floated above. In three hundred years we shall thus float into paradise. We might reach it sooner, whispered one. Unseen, we flit into those homes of men where there are children and for every day that we find a good child who gives pleasure to its parents and deserves their love, God shortens our time of probation. The child does not know when we fly through the room, and when we smile with pleasure at it, one year of our three hundred is taken away. But if we see a naughty or badly disposed child, we cannot help shedding tears of sorrow and every tear adds a day to the time of our probation. End of section one. Recording by Mammal, Tyler, Texas. Section two of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. 
Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Hans Clodhopper. There once was an old mansion in the country, in which an old squire lived with his two sons, and these two sons were too clever by half. They had made up their minds to propose to the king's daughter, and they ventured to do so, because she had made it known that she would take any man for her husband who had most to say for himself. These two took a week over their preparations. It was all the time they had for it, but it was quite enough with all their accomplishments, which were most useful. One of them knew the Latin dictionary by heart, and the town newspapers, for three years either forwards or backwards. The second one had made himself acquainted with all the statutes of the corporations, and what every alderman had to know. So he thought he was competent to talk about affairs of state, and he also knew how to embroider harness, for he was clever with his fingers. I shall win the king's daughter, they both said, and their father gave each of them a beautiful horse. The one who could repeat the dictionary and the newspapers had a coal-black one, while the one who was learned to guilds and embroideries had a milk-white one. Then they smeared the corners of their mouths with oil to make them more flexible. All the servants were assembled in the courtyards to see them mount. But just then the third brother came up, for there were three, only nobody made any account of this one, Hans Clodhopper, as he had no accomplishments like his brothers. Where are you going with all your fine clothes on? he asked. To court, to talk ourselves into favor with the princess. Haven't you heard the news, which is being drummed all over the country? And then they told him the news. Preserve us, then I must go too, said Hans Clodhopper, but his brothers laughed and rode away. Father, give me a horse. I want to get married too. If she takes me, she takes me, and if she doesn't take me, I shall take her all the same. Stuff and nonsense, said his father. I will give no horse to you. Why, you have nothing to say for yourself. Now your brothers are fine fellows. If I may not have a horse, said Hans Clodhopper, I'll take the billy goat. He is my own, and he can carry me very well. And he seated himself astride the billy goat, dug his heels into its sides, and galloped off down the high road. Whew! What a pace they went at! Here I come! shouted Hans Clodhopper, and he sang till the air rang with it. The brothers rode on in silence. They did not say a word to each other, for they had to store up every good idea which they wanted to produce later on, and their speeches had to be very carefully thought out. Hallo! shouted Hans Clodhopper. Here I come! See what I found on the road! And he showed them a dead crow. What on earth will you do with that, Clodhopper? said they. I will give it to the king's daughter. Yes, I would do that, said they, and they rode on laughing. Hello, here I come. See what I have found. One doesn't find such a thing as this every day on the road. The brothers turned round to see what it was. Clodhopper, said they, it's nothing but an old wooden shoe with the upper part broken off. Is the princess to have that, too? Yes, indeed she is, said Hans, and the brothers again rode on laughing. Hallo! Hallo! Here I am, shouted Hans Clodhopper. Now this is famous. What have you found this time? asked the brothers. Won't the princess be delighted? Why? said the brothers. It's only sand picked up out of the ditch. Yes, that it is said Hans Clodhopper, and the finest kind of sand, too. You can hardly hold it, and he filled his pockets with it. The brothers rode on as fast as they could, and arrived at the town gates a whole hour before him. At the gate the suitors received tickets, in the order of their arrival, and they were arranged in rows, six in each file, and so close together that they could not move their arms, which was a very good thing, or they would have torn each other garments off merely because one stood in front of the other. All the other inhabitants of the town stood round the castle, peeping in at the windows, to see the king's daughter receive the suitors, and, as each one came into the room, he lost the power of speech. No good, said the princess, away with him. Now came the brother, who could repeat the lexicon, 
but he had entirely forgotten it while standing in the ranks the floor creaked and the ceiling was made of looking-glass so that he saw himself standing on his head and at every window sat three clerks and an alderman who wrote down all that was said so that it might be sent to the papers at once and sold for a halfpenny at the street corners it was terrible and the stoves had been heated to such a degree that they got red hot at the top it is terribly hot in here said the suitor that is because my father is roasting cockerels today said the princess bah there he stood like a fool he had not expected a conversation of this kind and he could not think of a word to say just when he wanted to be specially witty no good said the king's daughter away with him and he had to go then came the second brother there is a fearful heat here said he yes we are roasting cockerels today said the king's daughter what did what said he and all the reporters duly wrote what did what no good said the king's daughter away with him then came hans clodhopper he rode the billy goat right into the room what a burning heat you have here said he that is because i am roasting cockerels said the king's daughter that is very convenient said hans clodhopper then i suppose i can get a crow roasted too yes very well said the king's daughter but have you anything to roast it in for i have neither pot nor pan but i have said hans clodhopper here is a cooking pot and he brought out the wooden shoe and put the crow into it why you have enough for a whole meal said the king's daughter but where shall we get any dripping to baste it with oh i have some in my pocket said hans clodhopper i have enough and to spare and he poured a little of the sand out of his pocket now i like that said the princess you have an answer for everything and you have something to say for yourself i will have you for a husband but do you know that every word we have said will be in the paper to-morrow for at every window sit three clerks and an alderman and the alderman is the worst for he doesn't understand she said this to frighten him all the clerks sniggered and made blots of ink on the floor oh those are the gentry said hans clodhopper then i must give the alderman the best thing i have and he turned out his pockets and threw the sand in his face that was cleverly done said the princess i couldn't have done it but i will try to learn so hans clodhopper became king gained a wife and a crown and sat upon the throne we have the straight out of the alderman's newspaper but it is not to be depended upon end of section two section three of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathy reynolds albany new york fairy tales from hans christian andersen translated by mrs edgar lucas the flying trunk there was once a merchant who was so rich that he might have paved the whole street and a little alley besides with silver money but he didn't do it he knew better how to use his money than that if he laid out a penny he got half a crown in return such a clever man of business was he and then he died his son got all the money and he led a merry life he used to go to masquerades every night made kites of banknotes and played ducks and drakes with gold coins instead of stones in this way the money soon went at last he had only a penny left and no clothes except an old dressing gown and a pair of slippers his friends cared for him no longer they couldn't walk about the streets with him but one of them who was kind sent him an old trunk and said pack up now this was all very well but he had nothing to pack so he got into the trunk himself it was a most peculiar trunk if you pressed the lock the trunk could fly 
and this is what happened with a whiz it flew up the chimney high above the clouds further and further away the bottom of it cracked ominously and he was dreadfully afraid it would go to pieces and a nice fall he would have had heaven preserve us at last he arrived in the country of the turks he hid the trunk in a wood under the dead leaves and walked into the town he could easily do that as all the turks wear dressing gowns and slippers you know just like his he met a nurse with a baby i say you turkish nurse said he what is that big palace close to the town where all the windows are so high up that's where the king's daughter lives said she it has been prophesied that she will be made very unhappy by a lover so no one is allowed to visit her except when the king and the queen go with them thank you said the merchant's son and then he went back to the wood and got into his trunk again and flew on to the roof of the palace from whence he crept in at the princess's window she was lying on a sofa fast asleep she was so very beautiful that the merchant's son was driven to kiss her she woke up and was dreadfully frightened but he said that he was the prophet of the turks and he had flown down through the air to see her and this pleased her very much they sat side by side and he told her stories about her eyes he said they were like the most beautiful deep dark lakes in which her thoughts floated like mermaids and then he told her about her forehead that it was like a snow mountain adorned with a series of pictures and he told her all about the storks which bring beautiful little children up out of the rivers no end of beautiful stories he told her and then he asked her to marry him and she at once said yes but you must come here on saturday she said when the king and the queen drink tea with me they will be very proud when they hear i am to marry a prophet but mind you have a splendid story to tell them for my parents are very fond of stories my mother likes them to be grand and very proper but my father likes them to be merry so that he can laugh at them well a story will be my only wedding gift he said and then they separated but the princess gave him a sword encrusted with gold it was the kind of present he needed badly he flew away and bought himself a new dressing gown and sat down in the wood to make up a new story it had to be ready by saturday and it is not always so easy to make up a story however he had it ready in time and saturday came the king the queen and the whole court were waiting for him round the princess's tea-table he had a charming reception now will you tell us a story said the queen one which is both thoughtful and instructive but one that we can laugh at too said the king all right said he and then he began we must listen to his story attentively there was once a bundle of matches and they were frightfully proud because of their high origin their family tree that is to say the great pine tree of which they were each a little splinter had been the giant of the forest the matches now lay on a shelf between a tinder box and an old iron pot and they told the whole story of their youth to these two ah when we were a living tree said they we were indeed a green branch every morning and every evening we had diamond tea that was the dewdrops in the day we had the sunshine and all the little birds to tell us stories we could see too that we were very rich for most of the other trees were only clad in summer but our family could afford to have green clothes both summer and winter but then the woodcutters came and there was a great revolution and our family was sundered the head of the tribe got a place as mainmast on a splendid ship which could sail round the world if it chose the other branches were scattered in different directions and it is now our task to give light to the common herd that is how such aristocratic people as ourselves have got into this kitchen now my lot has been different said the iron pot beside which the matches lay ever since i came into the world i have passed the time in being scoured and boiled over and over again everything solid comes to me and in fact i am the most important person in the house my pleasure is when the dinner is over to lie clean and bright on the shelf and to have a sensible chat with my companions but with the exception of the water bucket which sometimes goes down into the yard we lead an indoor life our only newsmonger is the market basket and it talks very wildly about the government and the people why the other day an old pot was so alarmed by the conversation that it fell down and broke itself to pieces it was a liberal you see you are talking too much said the tinder box and the steel struck sparks on the flint let us have a merry evening 
yes pray let us settle which is the most aristocratic among us said the matches no i don't like talking about myself said the earthen pipkin let us have an evening entertainment i will begin i will tell you the kind of things we have all experienced they are quite easy to understand and that is what we all like by the eastern sea and danish beaches that's a nice beginning to make said all the plates i am sure that will be a story i shall like well i passed my youth there in a very quiet family the furniture was beeswaxed the floors washed and clean curtains were put up once a fortnight what a good story-teller you are said the broom one can tell directly that it's a woman telling a story a vein of cleanliness runs through it yes one feels that said the water-pail and for very joy it gave a little hop which clashed on the floor the pipkin went on with its story and the end was much the same as the beginning all the plates clattered with joy and the broom crowned the pipkin with a wreath of parsley because it knew it would annoy the others and it thought if i crown her to-day she will crown me to-morrow now i will dance said the tongs and began to dance heaven help us what a way into the air she could get her leg the old chair cover in the corner burst when she saw it mayn't i be crowned too said the tongs so they crowned her they're only a rabble after all said the matches the tea urn was called upon to sing now but it had a cold it said it couldn't sing except when it was boiling but that was all because it was stuck up it wouldn't sing except when it was on the drawing-room table there was an old quill pen along on the window-sill which the servant used to write with there was nothing extraordinary about it except that it had been dipped too far into the ink-pot but it was rather proud of that if the tea-urn won't sing it can leave it alone it said there is a nightingale hanging outside in a cage it can sing it certainly hasn't learnt anything special but we needn't mind that to-night i think it is most unsuitable said the kettle which was the kitchen songster and half-sister of the urn that a strange bird like that should be listened to is it patriotic i will let the market-basket judge i am very much annoyed said the market-basket i am more annoyed than any one can tell is this a suitable way to spend an evening wouldn't it be better to put the house to rights then everything would find its proper place and i would manage the whole party then we should get on differently yes let us make a row they all said together at that moment the door opened it was the servant and they all stood still nobody uttered a sound but not a pot among them which didn't know its capabilities or how distinguished it was if i had chosen we might have had a merry evening and no mistake they all thought the servant took the matches and struck a light preserve us how they spluttered and blazed up now everyone can see they thought that we are the first how brilliantly we shine what a light we shed around and then they were burnt out that was a splendid story said the queen i quite felt that i was in the kitchen with the matches yes indeed you shall marry our daughter certainly said the king thou shalt marry her on monday they said do thou to him now as they were to be related so the wedding was decided upon and the evening before the town was illuminated buns and cakes were scattered broadcast the street boys stood on tiptoe and shouted hurrah and whistled through their fingers everything was most gorgeous i suppose i shall have to do something too said the merchant's son so he bought a lot of rockets squibs and all sorts of fireworks put them in his trunk and flew up into the air with them all the turks jumped at the sight so that their slippers flew up into the air they had never seen a flight of meteors like that before they saw now without doubt that it was the prophet himself who was about to marry the princess as soon as the merchant's son got down again into the wood with his trunk he thought i will just go into the town to hear what was thought of the display and it was quite reasonable that he should do so oh how everyone talked every single man he spoke to had his own opinion about it but that it had been splendid was the universal opinion i saw the prophet myself said one his eyes were like shining stars and his beard like foaming water he was wrapped in a mantle of fire said another the most beautiful angels heads peeped out among the folds he heard nothing but pleasant things and the next day was to be his wedding day he went back to the wood to get into his trunk but where was it the trunk was burnt up a spark from the fireworks had set fire to it and the trunk was burnt to ashes he could not fly any more 
or reach his bride. She stood all day on the roof waiting for him. She is waiting for him still, but he wanders round the world telling stories, only they are no longer so merry as the one he told about the matches. End of section 3 Section 4 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Sounds, Boston. Sarah Sounds Communications. Dot com. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Rose Elf In the middle of a garden grew a rose tree. It was full of roses, and in the loveliest of them all lived an elf. He was so tiny that no human eye could see him. He had a snug little room behind every petal of the rose. He was as well made and as perfect as any human child, and he had wings reaching from his shoulders to his feet. Oh, what a delicious scent there was in his room, and how lovely and transparent the walls were, for they were the palest pink rose petals. All day he reveled in the sunshine, flew from flower to flower, and danced on the wings of fluttering butterflies. Then he would measure how many steps he would have to take to run along all the high roads and paths on a linden leaf. These paths were what we call veins, but they were endless roads to him. Before he came to the end of them, the sun went down, for he had begun rather late. It became very cold. The dew fell, and the wind blew. It was high time for him to get home. He hurried as much as ever he could, but the rose had shut itself up, and he could not get in. Not a single rose was open. The poor little rose elf was dreadfully frightened. He had never been out in the night before. He had always slept so safely behind his cozy rose leaves. Oh, it would surely be his death. At the other end of the garden, he knew there was an arbor covered with delicious honeysuckle. The flowers looked like beautiful painted horns. He would get into one of those and sleep till morning. He flew along to it. Hush! There were already two people in the arbor, a young, handsome man and a lovely maiden. They sat side by side and wished they might never more be parted. So tenderly did they love each other. They loved each other more dearly than the best child can even love its father and mother. Still, we must part, said the young man. Your brother is not friendly to us, therefore he sends me on such a distant errand far away over mountains and oceans good-bye my sweetest bride for you are that to me you know then they kissed each other and the young girl wept and gave him a rose but before she gave it to him she pressed a kiss upon it a kiss so tender and impassioned that the rose spread its petals then the little elf flew in and leant his head against the delicate, fragrant walls. But he could hear them saying, Farewell, farewell! And he felt that the rose was placed upon the young man's heart. Ah, how it beat! The little elf could not go to sleep because of its beating. The rose did not remain long undisturbed on that beating heart. The young man took it out, as he walked alone through the dark wood and kissed it passionately many, many times. The little elf thought he would be crushed to death. He could feel the young man's burning lips through the leaves, and the rose opened as it might have done under the midday sun. Then 
another man came up behind, dark and angry. He was the pretty girl's wicked brother. He took out a long, sharp knife, and while the other was kissing the rose, the bad man stabbed him. He cut off his head and buried it with the body in the soft earth under the linden tree. Now he is dead and done with, thought the wicked brother. He will never come back any more. He had a long journey to take over mountains and oceans where one's life may easily be lost, and he has lost his. He will never come back, and my sister will never dare to ask me about him. Then he raked up the dead leaves with his foot over the earth where it had been disturbed and went home again in the darkness of the night. But he was not alone, as he thought. The little elf went with him. He was hidden in a withered linden leaf, which had fallen from the tree onto the bad man's head while he was digging the grave. It was covered by his hat now, and it was so dark inside where the little elf sat trembling with fear and anger at the wicked deed. The bad man got home in the early morning. He took off his hat and went into his sister's bedroom. There lay the pretty, blooming girl, dreaming about her beloved, whom she thought was so far away, beyond mountains and woods. The wicked brother leant over her with an evil laugh, such as a fiend might laugh. The withered leaf fell out of his hair upon the counterpane, but he never noticed it, and went away to get a little sleep himself. But the elf crept out of the dead leaf and into the ear of the sleeping girl and told her, as in a dream, the tale of the terrible murder. He described the place where her brother had committed the murder and where he had laid the body. He told her about the flowering linden tree and said, So that you may not think all I have told you is a mere dream, you will find a withered leaf upon your bed. This she found, as he had said when she woke. Oh, what bitter, bitter tears she shed. To no one did she dare betray her grief. Her window stood open all day, and the little elf could easily have got into the garden to the roses and all the other flowers, but he could not bear to leave the sorrowing girl. A monthly rose bush stood in the window, and he took up his place in one of the flowers, whence he could watch the poor girl. Her brother often came into the room. He was merry with an evil mirth, but she dared not say a word about the grief at her heart. When night came, she stole out of the house and into the wood to the place where the linden tree stood. She tore away the leaves from the ground and dug down into the earth and at once found him who had been murdered. Oh, how she wept and prayed to God that she too might soon die. Gladly would she have taken the body home with her could she have done so. But she took the pale head with the closed eyes, kissed the cold lips, and shook the earth out of his beautiful hair. This shall be mine, she said, when she had covered up the body with earth and leaves. Then she took the head home with her, and a little spray of the jasmine tree which flowered in the wood where he was killed. As soon as she reached her room, she fetched the biggest flower pot she could find, and laid the head of the dead man in it, covered it with earth, and planted the sprig of jasmine in the pot. Farewell, farewell, whispered the little elf. He could no longer bear to look at such grief, so he flew away into the garden to his rose, but it was withered, and only a few faded leaves hung round the green calyx. Alas, how quickly the good and the beautiful pass away, sighed the elf. At last, he found another rose and made it his home. He could dwell in safety behind its fragrant petals. Every morning he flew to the poor girl's window, and she was always there, weeping by the flower pot.
her salt tears fell upon the jasmine, and for every day that she grew paler and paler, the sprig gained in strength and vigor. One shoot appeared after another, and then little white flower buds showed themselves, and she kissed them. But her wicked brother scolded her and asked if she was crazy. He did not like to see and could not imagine why she was always hanging, weeping over the flower pot. He did not know what eyes lay hidden there, closed forever, nor what red lips had returned to dust within its depths. She leaned her head against the flower pot, and the little elf found her there, fallen into a gentle slumber. He crept into her ear and whispered to her of that evening in the arbor about the scented roses and the love of the elves. She dreamt these sweet dreams, and while she dreamt, her life passed away. She was dead. She had died a peaceful death and had passed to heaven to her beloved. The jasmine opened its big white blossoms, and they gave out their sweetest scent. They had no other way of weeping over the dead. The wicked brother saw the beautiful flowering plant, and he took it for himself as an inheritance. He put it into his own bedroom, close by his bedside, because it was so beautiful to look at, and smelt so sweet and fresh. The little rose elf accompanied it and flew from blossom to blossom. In each lived a little elf, and to each one he told the story of the murdered man whose head now rested under the earth. He told them about the wicked brother and his poor sister. We know it, said each little creature. We know it. Did we not spring from those murdered eyes and lips? We know it. We know it. And then they nodded their heads so oddly. The rose elf could not understand how they could be so quiet about it, and he flew to the bees who were gathering honey. He told them the story about the wicked brother, and the bees told it to their queen, who commanded them all to kill the murderer next morning. But in the night, the first night after his sister's death, when the brother was asleep in his bed, close to the fragrant jasmine tree, every blossom opened wide its petals, and out of every flower stepped invisibly, but armed each with a tiny poisoned spear, the little spirits from the flower. First they took their places by his ear and told him evil dreams, then they flew over his mouth and pierced his tongue with their poisoned darts. Now we have revenged the dead, said they, and crept back again into the white bells of the jasmine. When morning came, the window all at once flew open, and in flew the rose elf and all the swarm of bees with their queen to kill him. But he was already dead. People stood round the bed and said, The scent of the jasmine has killed him. Then the rose elf understood the vengeance of the flowers and told it to the queen bee, and she, with all her swarm, buzzed round the flower pot. The bees would not be driven away. Then a man took up the flower pot, and one of the bees stung his hand, and he let the flower pot fall, and it was broken to bits. Then they saw the whitened skull, and they knew that the dead man lying on the bed was a murderer. The queen bee hummed in the air and sang about the vengeance of the flowers to the rose elf, and that behind each smallest leaf lurks a being who can discover and revenge every evil deed. End of Section 4 Recording by Sarah Sounds Boston SarahSoundsCommunications.com